Well, I guess I'll briefly say who I am, so this has some context. Uh, I'm one of the programmers for Hatch Incorporated. Uh, I joined the company after I got out of college when I was 22, um, back in 87. And uh, we were on the Amiga then, and we'll be talking about that. Uh, I actually have two talks that I'm, we were originally going to kind of do one today, and one uh, later this week. Uh, we decided to do them both at once and you know, get it all over with. But the first thing I want to talk about is a general history of animation. Um, the entire history, not just computers. And uh, because it's very important, it, it all flows together. Uh, the second talk uh, is more about um, CG, computer graphics and animation, and how that evolved, and how uh, desktop computers and personal computers play into that, and how a lot of developments happened on low-end machines as well as high-end machines, and that's where we're, we're involved in, and so we have kind of a stake in that, and, and I'll talk about that there. So, to get started, <coughs> this is the history of animation. Um, animation has a long and illustrious history. The earliest forms of animation date back a couple of centuries before the advent of film. Its roots come from a desire to tell stories to an audience through the illusion of motion. The motion alone can convey, convey more than just narrative, it can convey emotion. When used with characters, animation can bring out much stronger emotions in an audience than normal film or theatrical performance. Computer animation is just the newest form of animation. The techniques and knowledge gained in the last century of animation can be applied to computer animation. A good knowledge of what has come before will be very valuable to animators who want to be part of the future. In the 17th century, a Jesuit priest named Athanasius Kircher invented a device called the Magic Lantern. It was a box with a lantern and glass discs with images, essentially a slide projector. By the late 17th century, Johannes Zahn mounted a glass, the glass slides on a revolving disc, which gave the illusion of motion. These devices were used to entertain the royal courts of Europe. Eventually, magic lanterns were used in public halls to entertain large audiences. They remained popular through the 19th century and were still used in vaudeville shows. In 1824, Peter Roger published a paper, published a paper called The Persistence of Vision with Regard to Moving Objects. <laughs> this paper describes the phenomenon that occurs in human vision where an image lingers even after the light from the source has ceased. If this did not occur, we would see a pronounced flicker in all films and on televisions and monitors. This phenomenon makes animation possible. This led to numerous philosophical toys during the 19th century. These include the zoetrope and the flipbook. The zoetrope consisted of a spinning cylinder with slits in it and a strip of paper with frames on it that you place inside the cylinder. When you spin it and look through the slits, you see the images animate. This can be used for cycling animation like running and jumping. The flip book is familiar to most of us. Sequential images are stacked in a small book and when you flip through the pages with your thumb, you can see the images animate. When I was in middle school, we had to read a few Shakespeare plays and the best part of it was that they had these huge margins uh, and so there's plenty of room to draw flip books. <laughs> when you're 13, it's not always, to make, not always easy to make Shakespeare interesting and relevant. We had a good time with that. It's a lot of fun. It's the best part. The first photographs were taken in the 1820s and 30s. They tended to be very static and mainly still life and portraits because of the long exposure times. This changed with Edward Mybridge. In 1873, he conducted an experiment to try to resolve a friend's wager about whether a horse trots. When, when a horse trots, there's a point at which all four legs are off the ground. Mybridge set up a row of cameras and was able to trigger them sequentially so that each camera captured a single frame of motion. The images could be flipped like a flipbook to see the motion and studied a frame at a time to see the details of the motion. This led to two folio sets of sequential photographs, Animals in Motion, published in 1899, and The Human Figure in Motion, published in 1901. Both of these volumes are still considered standard references today. 
In 1888, Thomas Jefferson pr produced a device for recording sequential images. The resulting images are then shown on a mutoscope, shown here, which is a device somewhat like an automated flipbook. You see? Mutoscopes were very popular in penny arcades. There's an old penny arcade in San Francisco where you can still find these today. Also in 1888, George Eastman patented roll film. The combination of these two technologies made motion picture camera possible. In 1895, in Paris, Auguste and Louis Lumiere showed the first public motion picture projections. The, the scenes of everyday life, the, the scenes were of everyday life, and Louis Lumiere predicted audiences would quickly bore of seeing images that they could easily go outside and see for themselves. He declared, cinema is an invention without a future. <laughs> it's nice to know some people are wrong. In 1895 in Paris, let's see, I already read that, didn't I? Okay, back in America in 1896, J. Stuart Blackton, a newspaper writer and illustrator, was sent to interview Thomas Edison. In return for writing the interview, Edison used his kinetoscope to film Blackton doing a sketch in a film called Blackton, the Evening World Cartoonist. Blackton was enthralled with the new process and quickly made his own kinetoscope. The following year, Blackton was one of the co-founders of the Vitagraph Company, which later was sold to Warner Brothers. If you watch some of the old Warner Brothers cartoons, you can see the Vitagraph name in the opening credits. Mm -hmm. I always wonder about that. In 1906, Blackton and Edison joined forces again to produce the first stop-motion animation of Blackton's drawings on a chalkboard and called it the humorous phases of funny faces. Meanwhile, in France, Emile Cole created a series of stick figure animation. In 1911, Windsor McKay burst onto the animation scene with his first animated film. Can you see over there? McKay was a well-known cartoonist and illustrator uh, for work such as Little Nemo and Slumberland. McKay's first films were actually hand-tinted after they were printed so that they were projected in color. This is 1911. In 1914, McKay's film Gritty the Dinosaur revolutionized animation. The reason this film is so significant is that until that time, animated films were essentially moving comic strips, and the characters had very little personality. McKay brought a sense of life and self-awareness to Gertie through the animation. Nobody had ever seen anything like it before. Today, animators still study his films to get insights in the subtleties of character animation. Several innovations in animation technology helped foster the new animation industry. First, in 1913, peg registered drawings started being used. With holes punched at the bottom of the pages and mounted on a peg bar, when animating, and also when the animation is shot under, cam under the camera, it was much easier to create sturdy, steady, steady, <laughs> to create steady animation. That same year, several animation studios were founded in New York. These studios were the spawning grounds of many influential animators, and later became the backbone of the animation industry. Bray Studios is one of them. In 1915. Earl Hurd patented the cellulo clear celluloid sheet, also known as the cell. This was, a, this was significant because it made, made it possible to draw the background only once and animate characters on top of it. Not only did the, this greatly reduce the work of retracing the background frame by frame, but it also later led to the cartoon look of black outlines filled with color that we are used to today. Also that year, also that year, Max Fleischer patented the rotoscope. The rotoscope used a technique that involved filming live action, live action actors in costume, projecting the film frame by frame onto a glass plate, and tracing the figure, adding other embellishments to create the final animated character. The result is, is very realistic motion. This technique is still being used, and is used in 3D animation packages like Animation Master. In my next talk, I'll actually show a couple. As people started going to the movies, the demand for short animated films grew to a point where a real industry could develop, and animation studios 
started to grow. Fleischer Studios was one of the successful ones. The period from 1916 through 1929, they produced a very the very successful Out of the Inkwell series, featuring the character Coco the Clown. These films combined animation and live action. Sullivan Studios had even more success at the time, with Otto Mesmer's Felix the Cat films. While many other animated films of the day were not much more than moving comic strips, Mesmer made Felix much more expressive. This led to Felix being the first real cartoon star. Not only were Felix films very popular, but so was the Felix merchandise. This was the first time an animated character garnered as much or more attention than a movie star. The power of animation was really beginning to take shape. Despite their initial popularity, the Felix films made by Sullivan Studios never adapted to sound. This may have been a reason why their popularity waned. When the head of Sullivan Studios died in 1933, the studio shut down and the Felix films stopped being made. I feel like there should be a dink sound when we change the slides. Oh, yeah. <laughs> For the, oh, those of us old timers. The history of animation that most people are familiar with is the Disney version. You can clearly see that to this point, there were many people in studios that came before Disney, but the influence of the Disney animated film should not be underestimated or understated. In 1920, Walt Disney and Ub Iwerks started the Laughogram Company and became make, began making Laughogram series in Kansas City. They got some distribution, but had trouble getting the distributors to send the money back to the studio. During the end of this time, they produced the first Alice in Cartoon Land film, but they lost so much money with the earlier films that they declared bankruptcy in 1923. Disney then moved to Hollywood and continued making the Alice in Cartoon Land series. He was later joined by Al Iwerks. The Alice films incorporated a live action girl in a cartoon world. Disney produced 57 Alice comedies between 1923 and 1927. This is long before Roger Rabbit did. As the Alice films wound down, Disney started in a new direction with a series of cartoons with a new character called Oswald the Lucky Rabbit. In the period from 1927 to 1928, they made 26 silent Oswald cartoons. They were distributed by, distributed by Universal. And in a contract dispute, Universal got the rights to the character. They continued to make, Universal continued to make the Oswald cartoons with Walter Lance. Disney had to move on without Oswald, so Disney designed a new character called Mortimer Mouse. He later changed the name to Mickey. They produced two silent films with Mickey, but it was their third that was actually the, fir the re that was actually released first. The, f the third film was Steamboat Willie, which not only made Mickey a star, but also was the very first sound cartoon. The decade from 1928 through 1937 witnessed a remarkable transformation in, of animation innovation at the Disney Studio. Animated films went from s silent black and white cartoons with simple characters and simple motion cycles to full color feature films with rich characters, music, and animated effects. During this time, Disney produced a series of cartoons called Silly Symphonies. In 1932, Disney released Flowers and Trees first cartoon made with Technicolor. For those of you unfamiliar with the Technicolor process, not only is it, it's, is it color, but the colors, particularly the reds, are rich and vibrant and a real treat for the eyes. Flowers and Trees also became the first film to win the Oscar for the Best Animated Short. Disney followed up in 1933 with The Three Little Pigs. Not only was it hugely successful, but it was also a breakthrough in animation because the three pigs were essentially identical, but you could differentiate them because they had distinct personalities in the way they were animated. In 1937, Disney introduced another technical innovation to animation in the short film, <coughs> The Old Mill, which won the 1937 Oscar for Best Animated Short. This film used the multiplane camera, a new device patented by Disney. Uh, this device placed a camera at the top of a rack, a tall rack, which then shot downward towards multiple layers of glass plates. 
each of these plates could move independently in three dimensions. This not only produced many layers of detail, but the camera could rack focus from foreground elements to background elements, and it added a level of three-dimensionality to cell animation. This concept continues today and is a feature of Animation Master, which that product that did this. Despite Disney's domination, other stu animation studios were also going strong. The Fleischer Studio started making Betty Boop cartoons, which were very popular, and U Universal continued making Oswald cartoons with Walter Lance instead of Walt Disney. The Disney-Oswald split had other side effects. Hugh Harmon and Rudolf Eisen were two animators that worked with Disney in Kansas City, and then in Hollywood on the Alice and Oswald films. They split, they split with Disney when Walter Lance took over the Oswald, Oswald films and started making Bosco cartoons for Leon Schlesinger, who sold them to Warner Brothers. Schlesinger became the head of the animation studio, which turned into Warner's animation studio. They soon split, split up in two, into two divisions. Harmon went to direct Looney Tunes, and Ising went to direct Merry Melodies. The Looney Tunes continued to star Bosco. In 1933, Harmon and Ising left Schlesinger when he refused to switch to color, and they went to MGM. There they produced Happy Harmonies. They were there till 1937. Tom and Jerry got their start in an Ising produced film. Another very important development was 3D animation and stop motion animation. The man considered the grandfather of stop motion as Willis O'Brien. He used a combination of soft rubber, clay, and armatures with 3D sets. His first film was in 1917 and called The Dinosaur and the Missing Link. After several less successful films, The Lost World in 1925 broke new ground. But he is probably best known for King Kong in 1933. With this film, O'Brien gave Kong a real personality to get audiences to really feel for him. Many years later, in 1949, O'Brien animated another giant ape in The Mighty Joe Young. Not the new one, the old one. <laughs> <laughs> one of the other animators on this film was a young Ray Harryhausen, who later became legendary for the Sinbad films of the 1960s. Mighty Joe Young went on to win an Oscar for best, the first, went on, went on to win the first Oscar for special effects in 1950. In 1937, Disney broke new ground by releasing Snow White, their first animated feature film. It proved to an audience, it proved an audience could sit through long form animation and led to a long list of high quality Disney animated films. It also led to a great deal of research and development at Disney in the mechanics of motion and animation. A greater sense of weight, momentum, and motion of humans and animals added to the quality of animation, not only at Disney, but other studios as well. Unfortunately, despite its success, Snow White lost money. The films that followed Snow White, like Pinocchio and Fantasia in 1940, Dumbo in 1941, and Bambi in 1942, contain what is still considered some of the best animation produced at Disney. If you are serious about learning animation, you should get these films on DVD and single frame through them. You'll learn a lot. Also during this time, a group who were to become known as the Nine Old Men came together at Disney. They are largely responsible for the quality animation at Disney and worked a lot with younger animators to develop and encourage the techniques that created great animation. Two of the nine old men are Frank Thomas and Ollie Johnson, who wrote the book Disney Animation, The Illusion of Life, which is considered a Bible in the animation industry. If you don't have this book, get it. You can get a good deal of pals funny and useful, hopefully. <laughs> Disney was not the first studio making animation studios during, not the only studio making animated features during this time. Fleischer Studios did their best to compete. In 1939, they released Gulliver's Travels. Gulliver was animated using the rotoscope process, with the rest of the characters being more cartoony. It was, rushed, it was more rushed than Snow White, so the animation quality is less consistent. That's still a really interesting film. Then in 1941, they released Mr. Bug Goes to Town. This film has some interesting similarities 
um, to Pixar's A Bug's Life. It's kind of fun to look at. The golden age of animation is generally considered to be the period between 1937 and the late 1950s. During this time, the studios produced some of the best and funniest cartoons of all time. If you're like me, you've grown up with Warner Brothers, MGM, and Disney cartoons. If not, you need to go back and rediscover these gems. The major studios of the Golden Age are Warner Brothers, Disney, MGM, Fleischer, Terry Toons, and Walter Lance. Warner Brothers was going strong with their stable of cartoon stars, including Porky Pig, Bugs Bunny, Daffy Duck, Elmer Fudd, and the Roadrunner. Terry Toons, owned by 20th Century Fox, produced Mighty Mouse and Heckle and Jekyll cartoons from the 19, in the 1940s and 50s. Disney continued continued to make animated features, but also shorts with Mickey Mouse, Donald Duck, Goofy, and Pluto. MGM produced the hugely successful Tom and Jerry and Squirrel Squirrel, Droopy, and Barney Bear. No relation. <laughs> Fleischer Studios, whose films were distributed through Paramount, produced Popeye cartoons and the amazing Superman cartoons. If you've never seen the Fleischer Superman cartoons, go out and get them. You can rent them. They have they have them on tape and DVD. They're simply amazing. They they use a lot of rotoscope and they're they're very cool. Uh, a lot of good 1940s propaganda too. <laughs> Might be offensive by today's standards. <laughs> Walter Lance also started his own studio after leaving Universal and made the very successful Woody Woodpecker cartoons. Okay, I'm going to talk a little about animation directors because it's good to know who these people were because they're very influential. Animation directors during the Golden Age had a huge influence on the evolution of the cartoon. Today's animators will probably tell you which of these directors influenced their style and tastes. After years of watching cartoons, I can tell you who directed a particular cartoon just by the style. If you're serious about animation, it's worthwhile to study these films and directors. I'll briefly touch on my favorites and the ones that I think were most influential. Bob Clampett was one of the first to run his own unit at Warner Brothers. He was one of the first to produce wacky cartoons and is one of the, original, or one of the originators of the extreme cartoon take. Cartoon take is a pose or some action that's extreme. This, becomes, this became the staple of the Warner Brothers cartoons and others. Clampett's cartoons also tend to be the most adult-oriented humor. Trust me, if you go back and look at some of the cartoons, you won't believe what they got away with. <laughs> in fact, they added some of them. They, he often liked to end cartoons with the character shooting himself in the head. Oh, that's, now I've seen everything. Bam! <laughs> 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 um, you can, when you rent them, though, um, they're usually unedited, so if you get a tape seem in their pure form. Tex Avery, who's my personal favorite, started at Warner Brothers and is credited for inventing Daffy Duck and Bugs Bunny. He made A Wild Hare in 1940, which wasn't the first Bugs Bunny cartoon, but it was the first one with the classic Bugs personality and the first uh, with the Bugs Elmer chase scenario. And the first What's Up Doc and all that stuff. Soon after he left Warner, Warner Brothers, he went to MGM. This is where he made his best films. Tex was, one, was the master of slapstick and has rarely been surpassed. Tex also was one of the most prolific anti-Disney directors. <laughs> Not only did he spoof Disney in his early films, but he brought a rough edge that, that was a stark contrast to the sugary kid-oriented fare of the Disney films. On a personal note, I'm such a big Tex Avery fan that I actually have a collection of uh, Tex Avery production cells. And uh, a couple cells and some drawings. Uh, and uh, my advice would be uh, don't get them at galleries, go to eBay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, didn't Tex Avery also do uh, the uh, Wiley Coyote on the Roadrunner? No, that was Chuck Jones. Is it? I will touch on that. That's okay. actually next. <laughs> Bob Clampett did uh, Beanie and Cecil. Yeah, he did. He did do Beanie and Cecil. Uh, Chuck Jones is another god of animation. I call him. Him and, him and Tex are gods. <laughs> Chuck's attention to detail and fine-tuned sense of comedic timing transformed mere cartoons into high art. One of the rules for Bugs Bunny was that Bugs was never the instigator. He was always provoked, which inevitably led to the line, of course, realized this was war. 
and uh, uh, Chuck Jones invented uh, the uh, Roadrunner, uh, Wiley e. Coyote and Roadrunner. It was actually developed originally to be a TV series, and it didn't uh, pan out funny, so he just made series cartoons for Warner Brothers. But he was hoping it would be a weekly series. <coughs> That's kind of why it was always sort of the same thing. He could just kind of keep churning them out. Fritz Freelang also had his own style. He had particular skill with Porky Pig, Yosemite Sam, and Sylvester, all of whom he invented. Bill Hanna and Joseph Barbera had huge success at MGM with, the, with Tom and Jerry. They were not as innovative as the Warner Brothers directors, uh, but they did learn a lot from the others, and it shows in their cartoons. <clears throat> in 1941, the Disney studio was rocked by a strike of animators who wanted to unionize. Many animators got laid off. In 1943, they formed United Productions of America, also known as UPA. Chuck Jones directed the first UPA film, which was a political ad for Franklin Roosevelt. UPA films, which were a departure from the traditional cartoon style, they tended to be more political in nature and ushered in a new style that was defined by stark colors, less realistic character motion, and a very graphic look. It was a very anti-Disney look that caught, that caught on throughout the industry. The opening credits for Monsters, Inc. Monsters, Inc. are uh, very much the UPA style. UPA later went on to produce Mr. Magoo and the Gerald McBoing Boing cartoons. I love saying that. <laughs> By the late 1950s, the cost of producing animated shorts was getting prohibitive and there was a drop in movie theater audiences. These factors combined to make the studio, the major studios, shut down or significantly scale back their animation units. One of the big reasons movie theaters were seeing a decline in audiences was that television finally emerged as a mass medium. People were staying home more for the entertainment than going out. This created a new demand, but required a new kind of studio, one that could produce a lot more animation in a much shorter time. Bill Hanna and Joseph Barbera left MGM and started their own studio called Hanna Barbera. They produced their first made-for-TV cartoon series in 1957. In order pr to produce the volume needed for a series, they took the stylized UPA look and cut it down even more. They reduced the number of frames per second and economized with cycled backgrounds and restricted character motion more. This became known as limited animation. It is commonly used to this day. In 1960, they premiered The Flintstones as the first primetime animated series, and it was at The Simpsons. Jay Ward was also a big player in early TV animation. His first animated series, Crusader Rabbit in 1949, was, was in 1949. It was sold city by city and not directly to a network so it isn't always recognized as the first animated TV series, despite being broadcast earlier. Rocky and Friends debuted on NBC in 1959. Through the, though the animation was very limited, it managed to appeal to kids and to adults because the scripts had a lot of wordplay that the adults could pick up on. They're great, I love those cartoons. They later went on to produce Rocky and Bullwinkle, Dudley Do Right, George in the Jungle, and Fractured Fairy Tales, as well as commercials for Captain Crunch and Quisp. Oh. Remember those? <laughs> I got to meet June Forey and Dawes Butler, old uh, character voice artists for them. Yeah, they're great. In the 1960s, as animation production in Hollywood declined, animation studios started to thrive around the world. The National Film Board of Canada financed a number of films in Canada, many of which uh, were very experimental and really pushed the medium. The library of great Canadian animated films is vast and definitely worth exploring. They're actually still financing films today. Eastern Europe and Russia also experienced a boom in animation. Despite the tight control the Soviet government had over filmmakers, animators seemed to have much more leeway because they often got around the censors with symbolism. Stop motion also became quite popular there of the world that saw an explosion of animation was Japan. This was the true birth of anime. Anime grew to encompass not only animated entertainment for children, but ultimately covered drama, comedy, action, and even X-rated films. 
It's definitely not just for kids. How many anime fans do we have here? Mm -hmm. oh, definitely. Okay. You can't go anywhere without anime fans. Knock him, knock him over. <laughs> Ray Harry has I love this guy. No summary of animation history would be complete without talking about Ray Harry. He has a huge, had a huge influence, not just in the field of stop motion animation, but also animated special effects in films. He was influenced at an early age by Willis O'Brien and even became friends with him. After high school, he worked with George Powell on a series of stop motion films called Puppetoons. George Powell went on to do the special effects for the original War of the Worlds. A few years later, in 1949, Harryhausen got to work with Willis O'Brien on Mighty Joe Young. He then went on to do his own. Uh, he, he then went on his own to do the animation for a series of 1950s sci-fi films, from *The Beast* from 20,000 fathoms to 20 million miles to Earth. He specialized in fantastic creatures and brought life to them in a way that surpassed what Willis O'Brien had done. This is why he is considered the father of stop motion. During the 1960s and 70s. He moved into fantasy films from the Sinbad movies and Jason and the Argonauts. If you haven't seen this movie, go rent it. It's great. The Battle of the Skeletons with the Skeletons still holds up today and is truly amazing. I still get goosebumps when I watch it. Mm -hmm. It's even more amazing when you consider that all the animation was done by one man, by himself. As a tribute to Harryhausen, the restaurant in the film Monsters Inc. is called Harryhausen's. Yeah. The restaurant in the film Monsters Inc. is called Harry Houses. Yeah. I actually got to meet him a few years ago at a SIFA thing. Wow. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. One guy. <laughs> During the 1970s, the bulk of animation was on Saturday morning and dominated by Hanna Barbera and Filmation, who produced Kid Oriented Fair. Disney continued to make animated features, but they dropped in quality and popularity. But the 1970s also saw the rise of independent animators that wanted to shake things up. Ralph Bakshi was one of the most prolific. After getting his start at Terry Tunes, he produced the first R-rated cartoon with Fritz the Cat in 1972. Many of his films had a gritty New Yorker urban feel, including Heavy Traffic, Hey Good Looking, and American Pop. He also delved into fantasy with Wizards and The Lord of the Rings. Not the recent one. <laughs> the animated one. <laughs> All of his films after Fritz the Cat used the rotoscope technique. They, um, so they had a stylized live action feel mixed with animation. In 1977, the world changed when Star Wars came out. Mm -hmm. This really ushered in the age of the special effects movie. Phil Tippett was the lead animator and did the animated chess game between C-3PO and Chewbacca. Pause while I refresh myself. Ah. Drinking problem. <laughs> special effects really took off after Star Wars. With the Star Wars films, Indiana Jones films, Close Encounters, E.T., Poltergeist, and countless other blockbusters, animation, uh, animation moved towards special effects. Industrial Light and Magic, founded by George Lucas, dominated this field. Much like Disney did in the 1930s, they invested a lot of energy and money into research and development and greatly improved the quality and quantity of animated visual effects. Computer animation also took off. The original CG studios did animation for commercials and flying logos for network TV. And as the computer dropped in price, newer CG studios came to take their place. Studios like Pixar, PDI, and Blue Sky began during this time. Also in the late 1980s, personal computers were becoming more capable and the first desktop CG animation tools started coming out, like Hash's animation, animation Apprentice. Most of today's 3D tools can be traced back to these programs. The end of the 1980s also saw some new animated features that 
breathed new life into the industry and created a whole new generation of animators. Were Roger Rabbit in 1988 and Little Mermaid in 1989. There was a measurable boost in interest in CG animation tools and many young animators that got started learning animation on personal computers are now the animators of the top animation studios. As the 90s began, the animation world was rocked by Ren and Stimpy. The man behind this was John Chris Valusi. In the late 1980s, he was director of animation on Ralph Bakshi's The New Adventures of Mighty Mouse. His influence in that series was clear. Clearly, there was a level of humor that was not directed at children, but more towards teenagers and adults. <coughs> Ren and Stimpy ushered in the sick and twisted cartoon on television. Chris Lucy combined a strong graphic style with Bob Clampett animation sensibilities and teenager level humor. Most of today's cartoon series are influenced by this show. And actually, he's coming back. I hear he's, there's a whole new Ren and Stimpy series coming that he's going to awesome. direct. So, I'm looking forward to it. Mm -hmm. Ren! <laughs> In 1995, Pixar produced uh, the first CG feature film. proved that a CG feature could, was not only possible, could have, but could actually be profitable. Taking a lesson, lesson from the early Disney days, story is the most important element to an animated film. It's a lesson that Disney also seemed to relearn when they released Lion King. It was the most, Lion King was the most profitable film they'd ever made. Many of their previous films had actually lost money. But Pixar opened the door to many other CG feature films not just from them, but from studios like PDI DreamWorks and Blue Sky. Okay, this is going to be relevant to everybody here, hopefully. Uh, the animation scene here in Portland is actually has actually been quite active over the last 20 years. Uh, the best known best known studio here is Will Vinton Studios, which is best known for popularizing claymation with the California Raisins. In the early 1990s, they started working with computer animation with the help of Hash Incorporated. That's us. Uh, their first CG commercials and a piece for Sesame Street were done with Animation Master. Portland is well known for other independent animators as well. Jim Blashfield has produced a number of well-known music videos for Michael Jackson, The Talking Heads, and Tears for Fears using his color cutout animation technique. Joan Gratz is well known for her clay painting technique which uses clay mixed with oil, painted onto a backlit glass plate. The animation happens by smearing the clay around and then taking frames of it. Her film, Mona Lisa Des Descending a Staircase, features an animated history of 20th century painting from Vincent van Gogh to Andy Warhol. It won the Academy Award in 1992 for Best Animated Short. Actually, I got to hold the Oscar ones. They're heavy. <laughs> Joanna Priestley has animated uh, many award-winning films uh, and is also very active in the local animation community. Rose Bond, another award-winning award animator, has become well-known through her direct animation films. Mm -hmm. Her films are created not, not through film, uh, but by taking a three... Uh, let me try that a second. Her films are not created on film, but are actually... Uh, created by taking a clear strip of 16 millimeter or 35 millimeter film and carefully drawing directly on each frame. Very oh. tiny. The amount of detail she's gotten into such a small, small scale is remarkable. She used to do it on 16 millimeter and as her eyes got worse as she got older, she moved up to 35 millimeter. Still big. <laughs> if you're interested in getting involved in the local, anima uh, the anim local animation scene, the best way is to join the local ASIFA chapter. ASIFA is the International Animated Film Association and is chartered under the United Nations. The ASIFA Northwest chapter was founded in Portland in the late 1980s and sponsors animation screenings and sometimes guest animator speakers. Oh, sorry. Um, guests such as Ray Harryhausen, Peter Lord of Ardman Studios, uh, and Bill Plimpton of 
some tunes uh, that have been featured. Asifa is a great place to make contacts and meet other animators. I usually have uh, meetings every month. We've actually ha held a number of meetings at Hashing. I think the next one's going to be up there. I think I'm actually going to be delivering one of those speeches, one of my lectures <laughs> at the next meeting. Today's personal computers are so powerful, they're faster than the $16 million supercomputers in the 1980s. And the software capable of high-end CG effects and character animation is as low as a few hundred dollars. Animation has always required prohibitively expensive equipment like 16 millimeter film cameras, animation stands, and many people to do inking, painting, and in-betweens. This can now be done for a few hundred dollars on a personal computer. The world of animation is open to you. You guys can be the next Tex Avery or Ray Harryhausen, and it's up to you to take up the challenge and show us what you got. That's me, this people. <laughs> Just a couple quick notes. Um, he mentioned the illusion of life. It is unbelievable. Unfortunately, it's also $60. You can only get it in hardback. It was out of print for a while, but it seems to be back in print back now. now. Um, one of the reasons why I chose this book is because it's an awesome, awesome, awesome second. And because of its price point, it almost makes it rival first. Um, we're all about price point. Who, who, did, who wrote uh, the, the Illusion of Life? Yeah. Uh, Frank Thomas and yeah. Ollie Johnson. Yeah. And they're still alive, too. Uh, and there, there was even a short film that Disney made about them that was like a little talking about their lives. They're like lifelong friends. And they worked on Snow White, and they're still alive. Wow. Most of the books you talked about and were characters and people that I could feel I was interested in looking up on them. Well, I didn't really make a bibliography, but... Uh, I can actually get you the text from a speech that you want. Yeah, we're, so. we're planning to post it on our website, ultimately. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, another quick note, just so you have maybe some things to associate with names in case you Nice. PDI DreamWorks did Shrek and uh, Blue Sky did Ice Age and Ants, of course. Shrek is my personal favorite that they did. So. Mm -hmm. 